Hello and welcome. Thanks for downloading the show. Welcome to Garden Fork Radio. This is the eclectic DIY podcast. We talk about what we think are interesting things. It could be home improvement. It could be how to make maple syrup. And that's actually what we're talking about today. We're talking about radiant floor heating, uh, a DIY method, which is really exciting, and reverse osmosis rigs for making your maple syrup. Two deep topics. And with me today is my friend Will from the Weekend Homestead. Hey. Hey, how are you, sir? I have no complaints. I can get up and walk and talk. I have a roof over my head. So good. The weather's great. It's nice outside. Get outside and have some fun. We had snow yesterday, an inch of snow out of nowhere, and I was mad. Not mad, but I was frustrated by the weather app. I'm like, why didn't you tell me it was going to snow, you know? (laughs) It's funny, there was someone who posted on the Garden Fork discussion group a picture of the frost in, I think it was like, uh, what is it, Yellowstone or wherever, where the frost is is on there because of the fog. We've been having that same effect happening here in Wisconsin, at least northern Wisconsin, at least twice, three times a week where you wake up in the morning and everything looks like a Hallmark Christmas card because it's all, you know, perfectly frosted. And then by midday when the sun comes out, it all melts away. But it's it's really neat every morning to see that. Makes you happy to be alive, right? Absolutely. And then you slip and fall on the concrete behind your house and start swearing. But that's a whole other story. That never happened. (laughs) So you posted on your Instagram and Facebook uh, feed, I guess you call it, a picture of a radiant floor heating turnkey kit, I would call it. So why don't you tell us the, the birth of this thing? So... Um, at the resort, we have uh, let's let's talk about the problem, then I'll explain the solution. The problem was the resort is only open five months out of the year, and in Wisconsin it gets really cold, so you can't have stuff freeze in the winter time, so you need somewhere to store it. Well, the property never had a storage um, building for that that was heated. So when we built a new operations building on the property, um, we got the idea to put in, Uh, piping in the floor, PEX piping, which would then become radiant floor heat. Well, then we started researching and figuring out, could we bring in a a contractor to install it and put it together and what would it cost? And, you know, with the small space, it's really super challenging because the space is only 20 by 20, so it's 400 square feet. To buy a commercial rig, you might have to buy all these other things that go along with it, like uh, storage containers to make it so that you don't short cycle your system, which is kind of a technical term. But anyways, we went through all of this to come to find out that there's a company called HydroSmart, which they're not a sponsor or anything like that. They're just the company that we used. And they had a, a system that works for small buildings from about 400 square feet up to about 2000 square feet. I mean, they have bigger units, but most people use them for a kind of smaller application. So we did some research and we ordered one and gave it a shot. So let's back up. Um, I have actually installed a radiant floor heating system as well. But for those of you that don't know what that term is, and that's a lot of people actually, you're, you basically are using a large mass, you're a concrete floor, which you have run tubing in. We call it PEX tubing, P-E-X tubing. And through that tubing, we run hot water, which heats up the concrete slab And once concrete gets to a certain temperature, it takes a long time for it to change temperature. So, and that slab, I don't know if the word is radiates heat, but it keeps the room warm and it is incredibly efficient. And I, I love radiant floor heating. It is, I think it's the best kind of heat to have. Well, for us, the the big item that we were looking at, because, I mean, we've done all sorts of different DIY heating solutions. If you went back through our Instagram and Facebook, we had when we did the Mr. Cool heating and cooling unit that has the fan and the blower and the heat. And some people have asked, why didn't we use that instead of the radiant floor heat? The hangup that I have with the space that we're heating is we're storing all sorts of things in there, like the sheets and blankets for the cabins. We're storing um, the chemicals. We're storing the cleaning supplies. We're storing food, um, you know, all sorts of items like that, where if you have something with a blower, it could blow dust around in the space and get things dusty and dirty with radiant floor heat, because one, there's no moving parts. And two, there's no really moving air other than the air that's being radiated. You don't have a real dust issue inside of the space. So we wanted to try to keep it cleaner. So it was the cleanest application with the fewest moving parts. 
So did you pour a, a, a new slab with the piping in it? Yeah. So we, um, if you go back, I think to October and I might actually bring these photos up because two people have asked about this already. Um, when we prep the space, it's basically a garage. So when we talk about an operations building, if you look at this, it's literally a garage door with a door and the sides, the floor is just a concrete slab. You know, uh, I think it's like six and a half or eight inches on the outside and then four inches in the inside, but we foam insulated the whole thing before we poured it. And then when they put the foam in, you take the PEX tube, you put it down on the foam and you use a special stapler and you staple the tube down, tape off the end so it doesn't get dirty. And it make you basically make two really long loops in there. We have 400 feet of pipe in a 400 square foot space because you want one foot of uh, every, for every one square foot, you want one pipe going through it. So we made two loops of 200 through the space and then that's it. And the, literally the glycol or the antifreeze or the water, whatever your system is running, pumps through one of the pipes, zigzags through the floor, and then comes back and returns to the, the device. And it's literally that simple. It really is. Um, I worked with a friend of mine to renovate uh, a three-family home in Brooklyn here. And the basement had... Um, oh, hold on. <coughs> Sorry, Sean, I'll make a note at 8 minute 20. We have to fix that. Uh, in Brooklyn here, uh, the building had what's called an English basement where the basement is below grade in the, at the road, at the sidewalk, and at grade in the backyard. So it's a walkout basement in the back. So it could be a living space. So we hired a crew to dig the existing slab out and some dirt. We laid in stone. Then we laid in uh, two-inch blue polystyrene, basically styrofoam insulation. And then we laid in the tubing with concrete reinforcing wire. And then we hired a crew to pour a four-inch slab. And we took the tubing and raised it up into the center of the slab. It wasn't on the bottom of the slab. So I think that's kind of interesting between the two designs. But And we bought a turnkey system much like yours from a company in Vermont, which I can't recall the name of because it was like five years ago. But And then you have two or three redundant loops in there. The idea of which is if one of these PEX loops or pieces of pipe springs a leak, you still have enough piping going through the thing that you're, you're not in trouble. So you can just turn off the leaky part uh, at what's called a manifold that where all the pipes gather. And it's, it's, it's so simple to do. The hardest part is the cement. Well, let me throw this in there. Cause I know this is the question that a lot of people ask is how much does this cost? Cause somebody posted on the, on my Instagram, boy, that looks expensive. Um, so the re the building cost is the building cost because you are going to put concrete on the floor in a garage anyways. You're going to put walls up anyways. You're going to put a roof up and all that stuff. So to add heating to a garage space, we had about $300 in foam and prep work ahead of time in, into the floor. There was about $250 worth of pipe, and then that's it. So to do the prep work, if you're thinking about building a garage or any space, you can put in the insulation, you can put in the uh, the PEX pipe, and if you never use it, it's not that expensive. But if you want to add it later, it's really expensive. The other item is, is that the unit that we purchased was $1,800. So for about just under $3,000, because there's a couple of little things you have to buy also along with it, but for about $3,000, we now have a heated garage, which in the grand scheme of things, if you wanted to add that later on back to an, a space, it's three, four times that cost. Yeah. So a little bit of prep work, $500. If you never use it, you know, you're out $500. But if you ever want to add it, it's super easy to add. I just, I love the turnkey. Literally, you, you ordered a box, you open the box, and it's essentially a mini furnace with some pumps and regulators, and you bolt it on the wall, you plug in the electric, you put in a thermostat and you connect the PEX hoses and you go. Yeah, it was amazing. Like when we got the box, I thought, OK, I'm going to have to assemble this thing and work on everything. Nope. It was all mounted and all measured and calculated and everything. All the math is done for you. Everything is basically done. You just 
we took four bolts and, and lagged it into the wall. And then we ran the wire from the thermostat into the spot where it says thermostat. Um, we ran the power cord to the controller and then we just hooked up the pipes on, on the bottom of it and away you go. It, it, it couldn't, it was amazing. It actually took longer to prime it than it actually did to install it. And you have a small, it almost looks like an on-demand electric water heater, which is running your slab. Right. Let's talk about that for a second. So HydroSmart comes with two different versions. They have a gas version and an electric version. The electric version they have... The, I mean, the unit is bigger is about the size of a piece of loose leaf paper. I mean, if you've ever yeah. bought a ream of paper, that's how big this heater is. It, I was amazed. I'm like, that's it? Yeah. Um, it, it was actually kind of disappointed. I thought it'd be something impressive. And it's just this little white box that has a light on it and a little knob. And that's it. That's all there is to it. Super easy. But uh, they have two sizes of electric. And then for the gas version... Um, that's when you get into like the bigger spaces. So if you had to do like 1500 square feet, or if you had to do 3000 square feet, you just get a gas unit that's bigger. But for us, because the space was so small, they recommend on spaces, let's say 800 square feet and smaller to potentially go with the electric one, just because of a bunch of scientific stuff that goes with short cycling and heat ratio losses and things like that. So electric recovers quicker and turns on and off versus gas where to burn a little bit of propane or burn a lot of propane, it's not as efficient as the electric would be. For the project that we did, we got the we we got the pump set up and then separately we bought a small electric domestic water heater. I mean it looks like a half barrel keg. You know, imagine imagine your regular water heater in your basement. Imagine one about 2 feet high. And so that is a continuous heat and then the uh, system will call for water from that. So the system turns on one of the pumps. I call them taco pumps because that's a brand of recirculating pump. And so it'll pull water from that little water heater, which has a reservoir of hot water. So it's a little different, but um, they both work brilliantly. And then my friend got tired of the little electric water heater and the rest of the building is steam heat. And he hired this genius boiler guy to plumb the radiant floor heating into the steam boiler and added on a controller such that the steam boiler, which is a gas-fired cast iron boiler, became a hot water heat system whenever that slab called for it. So instead of bringing the water up to 212 degrees, it would bring the water up to 120 or something. It was kind of genius the way the guy did it, and um, not everyone could do that kind of thing. But I, I'm i curious about thinking out loud here, the possibilities of doing it after the fact. I've seen some, it looks like uh, aftermarket systems where you run the PEX tubing between the, the, uh, the roof rafters of your basement so that your radiant floor, the first floor of your house. Yep, they they have a system that does that. Um, The same style staple that you staple down to the floor that the PEC snaps into, they also have that go into the wood and the PEC snaps into going up. The only item is is you might want to have like cement board or tile or something like upstairs because one of the benefits of the radiant systems is the thermal mass of the concrete. So if you're you're going to do it and add it to an aftermarket, I've seen a lot of people... You know, let's say they have a big tile space, staple it underneath, and then that heat radiates up and heats up that tile, and then that tile holds the heat longer than if it goes through carpet, which kind of insulates it, or, you know, a hardwood floor, which potentially you don't want to put a heating source under a hardwood floor because you, with the heating and expanding of the wood, you damage the floor. So if you have tile, probably pretty good. Carpet would insulate it maybe too much, and then wood floor, you wouldn't want to do that just because it would probably wreck it. That is so cool. Now we need to build a rocket stove to run the hot water source. You know what's crazy about it is that's it doesn't matter where your hot water comes from. As long yeah. as you have hot water, the system, it doesn't matter how you make it. If you make it in, like, a prime example, I have a wood boiler outside. The system I'm using outside, if you ever drive past a house that has one of those big wood boilers out in the yard, 
that system is doing the exact same thing. That wood boiler is just replacing that small electric heater that I have on the wall. Everything else in the system is exactly the same. That's the crazy part about it is it's completely scalable to whatever size structure you want to put it in. It's yeah, I love it. I absolutely love it. And if you're I mean, if you're considering a garage or an outbuilding or even a, a prefab home and you have to pour a slab, just throw the tubing in there, you know? Yep. If you use it, you use it. If not, you can use it as a selling feature for a future buyer, possibly. The only the question I always have is is PEX itself has crimp on connectors. And I I mean my my building in New York City is 110 years old and it's copper and cast iron pipes and I solder everything and I'm like, how long will PEX last? Well, I've been using PEX for five years now. I mean, it's not 100 years, but I've been using it for five years and I find my best slide on connectors go on copper because for whatever reason, it just seems to bite better into the copper, even though the the plastic is easier to work with. But like, I, I think a brand uh, is called Shark Bites and there's slide ons and a couple other different brands. But those types of connectors, I literally put a plastic sleeve inside. And then once you push this on there and once there's pressure on that, because there's the little teeth that are biting into the copper, it has physically no way to slide backwards. In fact, when you put those on, you better make sure that you're putting it on in the right spot because it's going to be really challenging to get it off. If you don't. Cool. I love it. I, I'm very excited about that. Nice. All right. We're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back and talk about exciting reverse osmosis for maple syrup. Stay tuned. <laughs> So the other day I made a video and I posted on YouTube about uh, what's called reverse osmosis. It's a homemade reverse osmosis system for your, for making maple syrup. And it is an, it is an additional step before you boil. And I got a ton of questions about it. And Will was like asking me all sorts of questions. So he said, Hey, let's just talk about it on the podcast. So here we are. Yeah, I mean, Eric, the video, it just it that's mad science at at its best right there. Using something um like that system to I I guess the first question is, are you using the water that comes out of that system or are you using the waste that comes out of that system? Like what part do you keep? Well, let's back up real quick. Um Sure. Reverse osmosis is typically a system used to purify water uh either in a home or in a commercial scale in the Middle East, they use it in desalinization plants, they're called. Uh, the U.S. Navy uses it to produce, uh, I probably ocean liners do as well, to produce uh, clean drinking water from the ocean. Um, and what you're doing is you're taking uh, water with either contaminants or salt or st stuff, other stuff in it, and running it through a series of membranes or filters, which are very similar to kidney dialysis filters. And you are stripping out or filtering out all the uh, what's called leachate um, and letting the water go through the filter called the permeate and in other words, you're getting clear, clean water coming out the bottom and cast off to the side of the canister, this filter canister. It's all the all the other junk, the other crud. And so for maple syrup, we are basically taking a, a 2% sugar solution tree sap and boiling it down to a 60% sugar concentration using incredibly Luddite old school method of a big stainless steel pan and a fire. <laughs> and that can get old really quick when you're boiling, you're boiling 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup. 
So what reverse osmosis system does is we're stripping the water out of the sap. So we're, we're dumping the pure water and we're saving the leachate. In other words, we're saving the crud that couldn't go through the membrane, the, the filter. And that is the sugars and the minerals and the sap chemicals, I guess we'll call them. And so we've removed a ton of water out of our sap. And so we're shortening the Luddite analog boil time. And that's why I built this rig. Okay. So there's been a ton of questions. I have a bunch of questions. Let's just dive into it because I'm guessing you probably have the answers for most of these. But like Naomi asks, you know, she, she's been looking at a system like this. Um, she built her first evaporator based on your system, but what was the rough cost for setting up? And then how often do you have to replace the filters in it? So it's about $350 to build it. There is a pressure boosting pump you have to buy, and it's about the size of two coffee mugs, but the pump is about $125. <laughs> that pump that you have, I mean, is that just a sump pump or what kind of pump is that? It's called a pressure boosting pump, and it's used, uh, it's used for reverse osmosis systems. So it's part of the reason why your home reverse osmosis system costs so much is that little pump that's in there. Gotcha. Pete was asking, you know, he stated, um, I understand the concept and how you plumbed it and worked together. Um, they do the same thing on naval ships. Um, in other words, the 40 to one ratio, if you run 40 gallons of sap through the reverse osmosis, say you get 15 gallons of concentrate, then you boil it down. Do you still end up with one gallon or how does that work? The ratio does stay the same. We're, we're just hacking the boil. We're pulling a lot of the water out before we start boiling the syrup, the sap. And you have to boil it because you're essentially at the end when you're getting the sugar concentrations getting higher and higher, you're basically toasting the syrup. And that's part of what gives maple syrup its flavor. Um, if you just tried to run maple sap through an RO reverse osmosis system to the point where you got it to 60 to one, it wouldn't taste the same. And it would also be incredibly hard because I don't think, I think the membranes would jam up. Um, oh, and the, the membranes usually last two years. You get two years out of them. I got a ton of this information from a gentleman who goes by the name of uh, Hoder Skib on mapletrader.com, the mapletrader.com forum. And he has been very giving, and he actually lives near me in Connecticut. And I'd like to, maybe I could go visit him. But I learned a lot from him, so it's not like I'm a scientist or anything. I just saw what he was doing, and I, I duplicated it. Okay, so that leads us to Dave was asking a question about you know these types of systems. What would happen if you raised the pressure up to, let's say, 200 PSI if you had piping that would hold it? Do you think it would work more efficiently? I don't know. I really don't know. I do know you hit a point of diminishing returns and to no return, basically, and from reading on the Maple Trader site, um, I have four membranes, and when you get to five or six, you you've kind of hit maximum efficiency. And after that, you're you're better off just boiling. You can boil the water off faster than you can trying to strip out more water out of your sap. Interesting, interesting. That, I guess the big question that I saw at least a dozen times is, what is the water that comes off of this taste like? Not this part that you're going to boil down to sap, but what is the water? Is it like some new health drink beverage that you guys are going to be launching? Well, interestingly enough, there is a basically, a, I think a New York kind of Wall Street guy bought a bunch of land upstate to have like a weekend house, you know, and that's, that happens a lot in New York. It's fine. And I'm paraphrasing the story here, but he realized that there are a ton of sugar maples and there used to be a maple syrup operation on this big piece of land he owned. And he applied uh, new business, you know, kind of new world business tactics. And he restarted the maple syrup business and he branded the maple syrup. You can buy it I think across the country now. I've seen it even in Costco. They have these huge reverse osmosis systems. They have these huge uh, boilers. And then, but with the reverse osmosis, they were casting off all this water. 
I could be wrong, but I think they bottle the water and they call it maple water and they sell it for like six bucks a bottle. <laughs> and it doesn't really taste like it, it. I can't taste the maple in it. Like when you, when you tap a tree and you take a drink from the bucket that you've tapped, you know, you've tapped off the tree there, you can taste the mapley sap. But in the, when you run that water through the vervous osmosis, the clean water that comes out, I can't, I can't taste anything out of it. Yeah. Like after I have three or four glasses of brandy while I'm boiling my maple syrup, I can't taste anything after that. So yeah. I completely understand. <laughs> I just, I like it because it's, it's kind of a new world technology and you're applying it to an old school thing. And uh, Will can also agree with me, I hope, that Boiling sap is is fun. It's something to do in the winter when you're bored out of your skull. But it's like watching paint dry. I actually, oddly enough, we use a timer system. So our Apple Watch has a little timer where you can set it for like an hour or two hours or whatever. I'll go out there. I'll fill the boiler up with the the uh, you know the sap that needs to get boiled down. I'll load it up with wood, make sure it's going really good. Set my timer and then go work in the garage or go do something else and then come back in an hour or two and then check it. Because literally this is, this is something you start in the morning at, let's say seven in the morning, you're super excited about. And then by about four in the afternoon, you're just dreading continuing to have to feed this beast constantly. But I mean, the result is great, but yes, sitting there for eight and a half hours watching water boil is almost the same as watching paint dry. Because the, this, the, the system that I have built, you have to constantly feed the firebox. And, um, and I like a big rolling boil. Um, and you can walk away from it, but the fire dies right away. So the uh, it's just, it was a fun gizmo. I had a little bit of extra money and I was like, you know, um, what's my time worth? So I was like, it's... That's true. I mean, interesting item talking about boiling. Since we're getting close to maple syrup and, you know, I'm into this hobby. One of the things that we did was if you go online, you can see what the BTU output of heat of different styles of wood is and at different um, moisture content levels. So the drier it is, of course, the better you are. One of the things we found is... I always thought, oh, I'm just going to get a bunch of pine for free pallets and throw them in there and just keep throwing the pallets in there and away you go. And we figured out that we put in probably about five to seven times the amount of pine into the burner. And when we started putting oak in there instead, like, you know, the chunks of wood that we just throw in the fire uh, for, mm -hmm. you know, campfires and stuff, that we'd only have to stoke the firebox maybe four times a day to do a whole day's boil versus the pine where every 45 minutes you're packing it full again. And the amount of time it takes to process all that pine to shove in there versus the amount of time it takes to just load up that little bit of oak. It's amazing the difference that you get. So you might want to try mixing different wood into your boil that, and it kind of gives a little bit different smell to it when, you know, it's smoking. So you're, I think the maple syrup tastes a little better when it's smoked with a little bit of oak and maple. That's interesting because I burn mainly scrap um, just from various projects. I have a shed full of scrap wood <laughs> and some of it, it's mainly pine, you know, pine lumber, but I do have oak, you know, from trees yep. that split and I'm like, well, I... Perhaps I will try that. That I never thought about that. That's, there, I learned something here. About 80% um, oak, 20% maple is kind of the thing. Because there's sometimes where the fire's dying, you throw the pine on top and it kind of kicks it back up again. And then when you get a good bed of coals going, you got a good rolling boil, throw the oak in there. And when that oak gets rolling, it's like a freight train. And it just, it's amazing the amount of BTUs you get out of that stuff. And we have uh, sugar maple is also called rock maple because it is hard to cut and split. And also it will burn, but you need something else burning already for the maple to get burning. Interesting. John asked, and I have the same question. What do you do with your maple syrup? Do you sell it? Do you give it away? Do you sell it on the website? What, what do you do with it? I don't make enough to sell. I, I give it to my friends. I give it to people that appreciate how much freaking work it took to make it. <laughs> So here's the big question. Um, what's harder, uh, a pint of maple syrup or a pint of honey? Oh, the pint of honey is much harder. Okay. 
and just... and the the mental drain is even is so much worse. <laughs> Sap season gives you something to do in the winter. Uh, beekeeping is I now call it a soul crushing hobby. Wow. I'm mentoring uh, some uh, beekeepers in a community garden here in Sunset Park, and I love that because we're doing it together. They bring a, a fresh energy to it, and they also bring knowledge that I haven't known about. But since I did it for eight years, um, you know, I just know stuff just from doing it. And that is a lot more fun than beekeeping on your own because it's just you. You know, so I, I agree. I mean, we if you remember back a couple of years ago, I did that little internship with the guy who had the beekeeping business and I'd go yeah. out and help him. And it was so much fun going and doing it. And then when we got to the point of doing it on our own, we I have the equipment all built and everything like that. And we never put it into play just because it wasn't the same when you're doing it with a bunch of people and you can interact and help each other out. And it's kind of a community thing. It was kind of cool when you have it on your own. Yeah, there's some enjoyment to it, but I don't know. I we got more out of it when we were doing it with the other gentlemen. So I might end up doing that again this summer is taking a couple of days off here and there and going out and just volunteering some time at the bee thing, bring my own, you know, suit or whatever it is and help them at the bee yard with their business. You know, no beekeeper will ever turn down free labor. So it's always a nice way to get into the hobby if you don't want to have the responsibility of having it but still have some interaction with that hobby. Yeah, the same with the maple syrup like one of my buddies texted me and like, Hey, are you, are you, how much, how much sap you're going to boil this year? You know? And I'm like, I, my answer, which I haven't answered yet is if you show up, we'll boil more, you know? <laughs> Cause it's for me, I do most of it alone because people are like, Oh, that'd be great. And I'm like, fine, come on over. And then they don't come over. And I'm like, why am I doing this? <laughs> See, I have the opposite where everybody shows up and you get everything going. And for about the first hour or two, like, yeah, this is great. And everybody's got, you know, they're drinking the hand and they're talking smart and everything like that. And by about hour three, like, how far are we? I'm like, well, we only got nine hours more to go. And they're like, ooh, I don't have that much. Ooh, hey, let's go over here and snowshoe or let's go, you know, <laughs> do that. So it's definitely a long play hobby. Oh, one more. Someone asked when I'm planning the tap this year. And we tap around President's Day. Okay. And um, my advice is to not rush your tapping. One of my neighbors who, uh, very nice people, but they just moved to town from a bigger town nearby, and they already tapped their trees. And it's uh, what it's almost, oh, today's not January 20th, it's tomorrow. So um, their trees are tapped. And if you tap your trees too early... The, the tree starts to seal up the tap hole. And so when it actually comes time to your, for your sap to run, the hole is sealed up from the inside. So ask one of your neighbors that taps trees. That's the best best time to tap, really. Can I, can I give you the scientific or at least the technology version of how we figure out when to tap? Sure. So on your phone, uh, if you have an app, and by the way, they're not a sponsor, Weather Underground, uh, mm -hmm. if you've ever used their app, what I do is I look at the 10-day forecast, and they have a really cool chart on there that shows the temperature fluctuation on if it's going to go high, low, wherever it is. And I watch for when that temperature on at least five days in a row goes above um, 50 degrees and is below 30 degrees and kind of makes that really nice sine wave pattern. When you start seeing that over and over again on the Weather Underground app, I see that, I start getting the stuff ready. When I see it five days in a row and it looks like the long-term forecast is going to continue to follow that pattern, that's when I start tapping. Also, another telltale sign is when the snow starts melting around my sugar maples. If you see like a foot of dirt, a regular earth, you know, soil around the trunk and the roots of the tree, that's another sign for me that it's it's time to tap. So nice. cuz the basically the soil is starting to warm up. Exactly. Wow. What a deep dive here. Super geek deep dive we've done today. Any reviews at all on the podcast? Oh, I haven't looked. Um I would like to uh, put a little plug in for the uh, Garden Fork uh, patrons. If you guys would be interested in getting a behind the scenes kind of thing, Will and I are going to do an after show right now of five or 10 minutes of off the record stuff that I share with my patrons. 
Uh, I just posted some pictures of a project I did on one of my sheds. I shot the video already, but I've already shared photos with my patrons. And I know it's just a little bit of uh, Eric letting, letting you behind the, what's it called? Behind the curtain. And it helps pay the bills here, really. Instead of me chasing eyeballs on YouTube, it allows me to work on making cool stuff for you all. So there's links in the show notes here for that. So just if you would consider that, that would be appreciated. Other than that, Will and I are going to stick around here. But if you have any questions, the email is radio at gardenfork.tv. If you want to find Will, just type in the weekend homestead and he will show up. (laughs) Absolutely. Or the Bear Paw Resort, either one. Oh, that's (laughs) right. Don't forget the Bear Paw Resort. If you are in northern Wisconsin and you want to go there, um, I have to go there one day. I will say, not to do a shameless plug on the radio show, but uh, we are releasing the calendar at the end of the month for the balance of the year of all the cabins that are open. And we were looking pretty booked coming into it. We kind of cleaned everything up, reorganized, whatever, and we will have some cabins available this summer. So starting February 1st on our website, you can click the Book It Now button and they'll all be there. Cool. All right, everyone. Go out and do cool stuff and make it a great day. I'll see you. Garden Fork Radio is produced by Garden Fork Media LLC in Brooklyn, New York. The music used in our show is licensed from uniquetracks.com and audioblocks.com. The executive producer of Garden Fork Radio is Jimmy Goots. You can learn more about Jimmy and the custom hollow books he makes at hollowbooks.com. All right, we'll try that again. I'm going to move the microphone closer and turn it, push it down a little bit like that. Three, two, one.